Well, how do we hold on to the way that Jesus sees the world in a world that wants to see things lots of different ways? We begin by looking at Jesus and we end up looking at the world like Jesus. We continue in our series through John this week in John 6 as Jesus shows us how much he can do with what little we have. I hope you'll lean in, download the teaching notes, and invite someone to watch along with you. Here we go with John 6. We're in a series called Come and See. Would you grab your Bibles and go to John chapter 6? Uh, now listen, we are uh, journeying our way through this account of Jesus' life written by one of his closest friends, John. I was joking with a friend outside. This book of John was probably written late in the first century by a guy who was probably in his teenage years when he was walking around with Jesus. He calls himself the most beloved disciple, but that's actually a pretty convenient time to write that because all of his friends had given their life for the cause. So I guess you can call yourself the favorite after everybody else is gone, right? Amazing account of Jesus' life. And here's how we're approaching this. That we want to see Jesus clearly. We don't want to just hear about him from others. We don't want to just know him by reputation. We want to look right at him. In fact, uh, imagine uh, you only were known by the reputation. Through, by, if we sat down and got to know one another, how excited would you be if I just sat down and said, here's all the things people have said about you behind your back. Anybody? Not a stoked moment, right? You would want the opportunity to represent yourself directly. This is what we're affording Jesus the opportunity to do. And here's why we're doing that. Because when you look closely at Jesus, you start to see the world like Jesus sees the world. And we, as followers of Jesus, want more than anything to see things the way he sees things. From ourselves, to our families, to our relationships, to our work, to our finances, to the community, to all the things that are going on in the world. We want to see those as much as possible the way that Jesus sees those. And when we look right at him, we start to see the world more like him. And so this is what we're after. I don't know what world you live in, but the world I live in, everybody wants me to see things their way. Can I get an uh-huh? All right? And especially in the year that we're approaching, we need to decide how do we want to look at the world? Because everyone's going to be recommending a way for us to see the world, to see the world like them and not like them, the good and not the bad, to see the, the things a particular way through this particular lens with this particular agenda. And what we want more than anything is to hold on to what Jesus says and how he sees things. So if you haven't found your way to John 6, please do so now. You can scan the QR and you can uh, jump into a digital version of the Bible if you didn't bring one. I'm a paper uh, kind of guy, so I encourage you, if you don't have a Bible, to grab one. We can help you out with one of those. But John chapter 6, we're going to look in to yet another window into the life of Jesus. And here's what I want to ask all along the way. Who is this? Like, pay attention to Jesus' character. If you've been following with us through reading through John, like all of us have been doing, uh, we ask these simple questions. Who is Jesus? What is he like? Who, what are people like, and how do we respond to that? So as I read, just check in on who Jesus is. Here it is, John chapter six, verse one. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and he sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. So he turns to Philip and he asks, where can we buy bread to feed all of these people? He was testing Philip for he already knew what he was going to do. Now listen, just pause before I read any farther. You're catching some editorial notes because remember, this isn't unfolding in real time. This is John late in life reflecting on his life with Jesus. So once in a while, he'll just pop out and give you an editorial note, right? So Jesus asked Philip a question, but he kind of had something in mind. John realized that later, and he wrote it down this way. Verse 7, Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy over here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone in the crowd numbered 5,000. Uh, if you're here in the room, uh, just take a look around the room for one second. Look to the farthest corner you can see right now. If you filled every chair in this room, it would be almost 3,000. 
So 5,000 men plus their family, Jesus is looking across a crowd of 15 to 20,000 people, okay? Five or six of these rooms. Tell everyone to sit down. Uh, the crowd numbered 5,000 men. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. Tell somebody next to you, as much as they wanted. As much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left for the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. This is probably a familiar story to many of you. you. Even if you're not really a follower of Jesus or not a Bible reader, you're probably familiar with the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And it's easy to dis, like, just dismiss it on familiarity alone. But just ask our simple questions. What does this say about who Jesus is? And more importantly, how he sees the world and how he sees it differently than many of us often do. Uh, right out of the gate, you see him ask a question to Philip that John realizes later Jesus already had a plan. So why did Jesus ask a question if he already knew the answer? I mean, he's watching just massive amounts of people arrive and he looks at one of his friends and he says, what's our plan? How are we gonna feed these people? He wanted Philip to realize very quickly, hey man, all the resources you brought, not gonna be enough. And I'm just wondering as we encounter Jesus, are we willing to acknowledge our own limitations? Jesus demanded that Philip acknowledge his limitations. Jesus knew that Philip was not a match for the task that was arriving in front of him. Philip was one of the guys who kind of kept track of the group and uh, often was the, the one who kind of managed details. And so he says, hey, detail guy, detail this. <laughs> now, it seems a little bit harsh, and I don't mean to seem that way. I just think Jesus is one who will always confront us with reality, not as we want it to be, but as it actually is. He knew there was not enough money, there was not enough time, and no one had a good plan. And here's my hunch, is that Jesus reveals us to us so that we can look to him. When we come to the end of ourselves and recognize that our plan is not gonna be a match for the task ahead of us, it's an opportunity for us to reach for someone else, most of all, him. And so he was inviting Philip, hey, let's just agree on the situation. No one knows what to do, right? This created space for Jesus to do something that no one else could do. When they were facing scarcity in every single front, Jesus said, I have a different plan. Are we willing to be the kind of people who are gonna acknowledge the difference between what we brought and what is required? Now, I don't know the last time you had to feed 5,000 people. Probably doesn't apply directly to you, but I'm guessing there's a situation in your life where what is required and what you have access to do not match. Is anybody with me? Not enough money, not enough time, not enough wisdom, doing our best as parents doesn't seem to be working out, doing our best as neighbors can't quite figure it out. There's all kinds of situations where we come to the end of ourselves and realize, oh, I just need more than I brought. We can find ourselves in this story, and Jesus, in those moments when we see scarcity, frustration, and no viable way forward, when we're trying to feed 20,000 people with a sack lunch, when we're stuck, Jesus sees something differently. But I do wanna ask, are we willing to at least bring what we have, even when it's not a match for it? We see that in the story too, right? Andrew was one of the followers of Jesus. You'll see at least three times across the Gospel of John, he brings people to Jesus. This is one of them. He's, a, he's the guy always kinda working the crowd on the edges. You know, you imagine Jesus in his entourage walking around, and Andrew's just kinda working the crowd, meeting people along the way, and he's chatting it up with this young kid maybe playing on the side and realizes he's got a lunch and he brings this kid forward and what a cool gift that this young boy in obscurity who just was probably serving his family at the, at the request of someone else in his family sending a lunch along gets drawn into a pretty epic story. Andrew brings him over and I'm just asking, I'm just wondering, are we willing to bring what we have? What we see in the story as it unfolds, you heard it really quickly, a sack lunch that seems totally inadequate becomes uh, how much did they have? Do you remember how much? Uh, you said it to somebody around here. Uh, how much did everybody have? As much as they wanted. And when they were full, there were leftovers. This is a story that began in scarcity and ended in abundance. 
Here's what I wanna say that we see in the story is Jesus can do more than we think with what we have. Jesus can do way more than we think with what we have. Tell somebody, way more. You got great ideas. Anybody got great ideas? Show of hands, who's got great ideas? Who, who at least at the front end thinks they have great ideas? Anyone? All right, more hands at this point, right? We all love our ideas or we wouldn't have them or at least we wouldn't say them out loud, right? We love our, how many of you have had great ideas that in the end fell like totally short? Anyone? Man, I remember this, I don't know why I'm telling this story, but one of my most embarrassing moments of my whole life I ended up, I was at this college, and I thought it was an open gym basketball thing, and it turns out it was a tryout. Didn't know that. <laughs> the whole school, is small school, but the whole school shows up to watch, and I'm like, this escalated quickly, right? I am a mediocre basketball player on a good day, okay? But even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while, and I pick off a pass at the top of the key, and there's nothing but daylight between me and the hoop at the other end of the court. You know what I'm saying? Now, I, there's no threat that I'm gonna dunk. Just look, right? Not happening. But I had Michael Jordan in mind and this nice little layup, and I go to plant my foot and my knee buckles. And um, you know that sound that skin makes on a wood floor when sliding? That came to an abrupt halt when I hit the wall, all right? We, it, it looks so good in our head and so often things just completely fall apart. But here's the beauty, is that when we invite Jesus into our lack and our scarcity, he can create abundance. I just don't want us to miss that. It, can we hold on to, can I get a head nod that you'll hold on to that? Because here's what's gonna happen in the next several months. People are gonna create fear in all of us based on the idea of scarcity and try to drive us into their opinion and their approach on the world. And I just wanna say, we don't have to see the world that way. We can acknowledge the gap between what we would like to be true and what is true and trust that Jesus has something in mind that will carry us through. He may not rescue out of it, us out of it. It may not be the plan that, he has, that we had in mind for us, but we've all just agreed our plans are mediocre on a good day, right? His plans are good, he can make abundance out of scarcity. He can do more than we think with what we have. I love this, in fact, uh, there's this image I was offered this past week. Did you know it was bring a child to work day this past week? Anybody try that nonsense, anyone? <laughs> oh my goodness, I, had one, I got home from a trip and I, I took one of my kids along to work. I was like, I gave in, I was too tired, I don't know what happened, but he wanted to skip school and I wanted to hang out with him and so we did it, it was great. Uh, here's the thing. <sighs> Kids on Bring Your Child to Work Day are just really unhelpful. <laughs> Did you know this? It's like, it's a plan for getting a lot less done. That's, that's what that plan is. There's a guy on our staff who has young twins and he had a checklist and coloring books and all the supplies and backpacks, the sweetest thing ever. They're walking around, they're having a blast. You know how much work they help their dad do? Zero, right? <laughs> Absolutely none. Uh, but it reminded me of a comment a friend of mine, uh, one of our elders made the weekend before. He just said, with God, every day is bring your child to work day. <laughs> Let that sit for a minute. <laughs> I was like, that's really sweet. Also, oh, <laughs> you know, kids walking around, these two twins with their dad are like, we're helping, we're helping. I'm like, yeah, you're helping. <laughs> it's the same, like God can do way more. Somebody say way more. But there's something really important and meaningful in bring a child to work day that has nothing to do with efficiency, right? Like this is what Jesus is saying, like he called Philip and Andrew, this young man with a sack lunch gets drawn into what Jesus was doing. I guarantee that kid told that story for the rest of his life. There are moments, right? And so here's my, here's my question is like, are we, not only are we willing to bring what we have, but are we willing to sit and see what God has in mind? Like Philip and Andrew could have gone around scurrying, trying to come up with another plan. They could have run off to town and tried to get people to donate. They could have tried to grab the bull by the horns or pull the boots up by the bootstraps and just like muscle on through. Is anybody else in here like me where if there's a gap in a plan, I'm, I'm going fast, I'm going hard, I'm gonna take charge and we're going somewhere even if it's a bad idea. Anybody with me? But you gotta, gotta do something. Let's do, somebody's gotta do something. I went to a lunch place this past week and I'm like, this could, could not be going slower. I would, can I just wash my hands and join you back there? Like, let me. <laughs> so maybe it's just me. It doesn't sound like I'm alone, but it's interesting to me. When I, in my time alone with God, as I was encountering John 6 a couple weeks ago, 
I just think it was striking that Jesus said, hey, everybody sit down. Everybody just sit down. Let me do what I'm gonna do. Stop trying to do all the things you're gonna do. Just sit down. And by the time Jesus was done doing what he was gonna do with what they brought, everyone had how much? Do you remember how much? As much as they wanted. When we see scarcity, Jesus can create abundance. Where we lack a way forward, Jesus can make a way forward. And these are lenses we need in the world in which we live. It is who he is, and he's inviting us to see the world that way. Now, I I wanna make a turn that's really, really important that comes in the next few verses. Because some of you might be thinking I'm I'm preaching like a, a health and prosperity gospel that if you just follow Jesus, everything's gonna be okay. Jesus will take a little bit of money that you give him and he'll multiply it hundredfold and you'll be rich and wealthy and comfortable and all the things. Anybody who talks like that has never read the Bible, okay? Because the Bible is full of people who offer to the very cost of their lives the challenge just for something way greater. Jesus is not talking about abundance in our finances, though he can do that. If he does, it's for generosity, just so you know. We're not just talking about an abundance of provision, though at the right time, I bet you could ask any number of people who came to the end of themselves, offered God what little they had, and he did much with it. Can I get a head nod if you have any stories in your life like that? Just look around the room. If you know that person, you should ask them for that story. We should be telling those stories to one another. And if you're wondering if God has good in mind, you need to talk to those people. Jesus writes those stories. But he's not just talking about physical provision. In fact, the rest of John 6, you gotta read it. The rest of John 6 is people, it's like, if I were to give it a title, it would be Adventures in Missing the Point. (laughs) Because this story isn't about the bread and it's not about the fish. The bread was just a picture, it was not the point. The bread was not the, the heart of the story, it was instead the provider. The bread was just an image of of what Jesus is capable of and interested in doing in our lives. Does Jesus address our physical needs? Of course he does. Does he care deeply? Yeah, he says, if I can care for the flowers of the field which are here today and gone tomorrow, I can certainly take care of you. Can someone bear witness that Jesus will take care of you when you thought all your resources were gone? Yes, he can do that. But if that were all he did, oh my goodness, it would be so far short of who he really is. He goes so much farther than that. But the people miss the point. Verse 14, if you still have your Bible, or here it is on the screen. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he's the prophet we've been expecting. Now, I gotta give you just a touch of background to understand why this is missing the point. Uh, Hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus, there was a guy named Moses. Ever heard of him? Do you remember the basics of the story of Moses? God's people in slavery in Egypt. God gets this guy out of obscurity named Moses and sends him to represent him. And by a bunch of miracles, God carries two million of his people out of slavery into the desert, promises them a land flowing with milk and honey, out of scarcity into abundance. Are you picking up what I'm putting down right now? But they find themselves in the middle of the wilderness and they have nothing to eat. And so God miraculously provides bread. Are you seeing the connection in the stories yet? Connections everywhere. Massive number of people with no access to food and God does something miraculous. You cannot read. John's audience could not read John 6 without hearing the story of the Exodus. And neither could the people who heard Jesus teach and got the food that day. They had how much did they have? What was it again? How much did they have? As much as they wanted. But they still somehow missed the point. Now this guy Moses... There was a promise in the Old Testament of the scripture that said one day there would be a prophet just like him who God sends to turn everything right side up. And so these people sitting on a hillside having a stomach full of bread and fish that there was a miraculous provision are thinking this is it, this is the guy. But they still miss the point. They still miss the point. They're thinking he's gonna come and provide the kind of rescue that Moses provided a political, cultural rescue. And Jesus is like, I could do that, but you'd be settling for far less than I have in mind. What Jesus was inviting them to was not just a rescue out of their situation, but a rescue into relationship with him that would carry them through any situation. 
In case you missed it, I just wanna try to say that again. Some people show up hoping that Jesus will rescue them out of their current situation when what Jesus actually does is meets you and sustains you through any situation. It was not about bread on one day, it was about the bread of life every day. It wasn't about the bread, it never was, it was about the provider. And Jesus is like, this is just a picture. You're satisfied physically, but you're not satisfied spiritually and I have so much more in mind. He says this in verse 32, I'll give you some highlights, but you gotta read the rest of John chapter six. Here's just a few cliff notes. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. You think he was the rescuer you need? Moses is not the rescuer you need. And by the way, he wasn't the one who provided the bread anyway. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. He's saying, I am here to do something that supersedes political rescue. I am here to do something that supersedes physical hunger. I am here to provide something for you that will sustain you always. He just had a totally different picture. So the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life. Tell somebody next to you, life. Not just immediate satisfaction, not just provision, not just abundance where there was scarcity, but like life. Not just alive, but like living. Other places in John, if you're reading along with us, you're encountering this. Life to the full, life abundantly, not life marked by fear and scarcity and scraping by and doing what we can with what we have, but inviting God to do something with what we have that we could never do on our own. The bread was just a picture, it was not the point. In the Old Testament and in this story in John 6, which is why Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You wanna be with me because I fed you. How many moms just felt that to their core? (laughs) Like, did that just move your soul? You want to be with me because I fed you. Not because you understood the miraculous signs, but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Don't. I don't wanna get too political. We, we make it a point around here not to tell you, we, we don't think it's the place of, of this stage to tell people what to do with their politics. But we do wanna look at things like Jesus. And so Jesus says, don't be so concerned with perishable things like food. There are a number of things we're gonna be invited to be very concerned about. And Jesus is like, be concerned about things that matter most and let that influence how you address all the other things that are important and need thoughtful engagement. He says, spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. And they're like, listen, we wanna do God's works too. What do we do? And Jesus told him, the only work that God wants from you is believe in the one he has sent. He's saying, you're satisfied with the bread I've given you, but I'm the bread. You'll read this in John chapter six. Tell somebody John six. You may have already read it if you're following along with us. You need to go back and read again. What does it mean that he's the bread of life? What is he really offering? What is the abundance that he's inviting us into to meet us in every single situation? Belief is not like, check, I agree with that. Check, yes, I think that. Check, I definitely posted that on Facebook one time with a pretty picture. That's not what he's saying. Belief is a life aligned with the things that he has said. Actions influenced by the things that he has said are true about the world. When we live with the expectation that God has a way forward where we don't see one, now we're a believer. When we live refusing to be afraid of scarcity and trusting ourselves to others and to God along the way, now we're starting to believe in the one he has sent. When we stop asking him to do stuff for us and begin trusting him to be with us, now we've moved to belief. Anyone can be stoked when Jesus does awesome stuff for you. This is what those people in the beginning of John were saying. They're chasing him around the lake looking for the next amazing thing to impress them and entertain them, to provide for them. And Jesus is like, you're settling for too little. I'm offering you not bread, I'm offering you myself. There's something so much more personal going on here as you read John chapter six, and Jesus tries to raise their eyes to the horizon of what he's trying to do, to get out of what's immediately in front of them and say, there's a bigger thing happening. You've gotta read it, tell somebody John six. 
they take it one step farther. Not only did they think that Jesus was gonna be like the political rescuer, they're like, you know what, let's go ahead and make this official. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Jesus saw they were not getting the picture. They wanted him to be the king they had decided ahead of time that they needed. And Jesus is like, I will not satisfy your request. You are settling for too little. You don't need a king to con conquer Rome. You need a king to conquer what's wrecking you inside. You don't need a king to provide food for you. You need king to give you daily bread that actually calls you alive whether you have food or not. You need, he's saying you need me. You need a different kind of king. And I just, I'm just reminded in John chapter six when, when all of that expectation is bearing down on Jesus, I'm just reminded Jesus is not what we make him. We don't get to decide who he is. We can acknowledge him for who he has always been and respond to him based on who he says he is, but we don't make him anything. He is what he is, and he's not what others make him either. This is why we look right at him. Jesus, I wanna receive you on your terms and decide based on what you say and what you do, who you are and who I'm gonna be in response to that. Uh, let me say it a different way. We are not king makers. This is what people didn't realize. They were ready to make him king. We are not king makers. That never goes well. Just read the history of the people of God. I got a buddy reading the Old Testament right now. He's in First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. It's one disaster after another. We are not king makers. We are king believers or not. We can align with the king who has good in mind for us. We can see the pictures he's painting for us. We can look through the lenses he is offering us, but he will not adjust who he is because that would be bad for us. Jesus was going to be king, just not the king they wanted him to be. And I'm just wondering if you could take a moment of reflection and ask yourself, is there anything Jesus hasn't been that you were really hoping he was? Anybody disappointed by Jesus? Can we just say the unsayable? Because I just gotta tell you, there's times I've been totally disappointed by Jesus. You know why? Because my expectations were all wrong and they were way too small. Disappointment will always reveal your expectations. You ever have somebody get mad at you and you have no idea why? It's because they had an expectation that you didn't know and maybe they didn't know, but y'all found out when they were ticked, right? Listen, people come with expectation of Jesus all the time and often end up disappointed, not because Jesus, Jesus is disappointing, but because we've been expecting far too little. The kind of king we think we need isn't always the kind of king we actually need. And Jesus is so loving, so kind, so wise, so genius. There was never a time he wasn't. There is never going to be a time where he won't be. He is eternally consistent. He will never change. And even when we're disappointed and throw a fit like a toddler on bring your kid to work day, he will remain the same for our good because he loves us and he's after us. And some days he'll give us more than we expected. And some days he'll just walk with us through the lack and the scarcity and the fear and just be present with us and invite us to trust him in every single moment. He was not inviting them to enjoy bread every day. He was in inviting them to enjoy him every day. And so I'm just wondering, as we reflect on our disappointment, could we just ask, man, are we acknowledging Jesus as king? He's not a life improvement plan. He's not like an upgrade to offer you along the way. He is not here to make your life better. He is here to end life without him and resurrect a brand new kind of life with him. He is not here to improve your life. He's here to remake you. This is what he does in all of the very best ways. It's what he was offering these people and they missed it. It's what he's offering us and I don't want us to miss it. And the joy is, is he says, if you'll let me, I'll go with you every single day. I'm a benevolent king who has so much good in mind for you. I lack nothing. You can have, how much did he say we can have? What did we say?
We're not talking about bread. We're talking about presence with the one who spoke you into existence, who will carry you through every challenge in your life, who will meet you in the financial struggle, who will repair relationships, who will never lose sight or lose track of you anywhere along the way. You can have as much as you want. And so here's my question. When Jesus says, sit down, will we sit down? How could we be the kind of people who just sit with God daily? And instead of trying to grab the bull by the horns or the boots by the straps, just say, God, what do you have in mind? God, do what you're gonna do. God, take this sack lunch and do something meaningful with it. Will we, will we receive what would easily be called daily bread? Uh, any followers of Jesus who sit with God on a regular basis, can we just, I don't know what your experience is. Mine is the days I sit with God at the beginning of the day are entirely different than the days I don't. Can I get a head nod? He just does something that cannot be explained. I don't know how he takes five loaves and two fish and feeds 2,000 people, but he just marks me each day. And there's this satisfaction and bread of life that just can't be explained any other way. And I just wanna ask us all to be the kind of people who sit with him daily. Can we be people who sit with him daily? If you wanna join in with us, we're doing it. You don't have to do this, but if it makes your life easier, we're just sending some reminders. Send a text. Ton, tons of us, thousands of us are doing this already, but if you just showing up here, sit with God daily. Like, I don't know how to do that. This will help you. Just send a text, super simple. It doesn't say Devine, it says dive in. Dive in, no spaces, don't let autocorrect wreck your life. Dive in to 94000. Sit with God daily. Number two, how will we respond to Jesus like he's king? Jesus is not an information source, he is a transformation agent. We don't go to him to learn information. We go to put into practice the things that he is saying, to see him and see the world like him and act on what we see. And so when we sit with him daily, are we marked by the people who act on what we see in Jesus? To refuse to live in fear and scarcity, but to count on his peace and presence. To show up with generosity. How would you put into practice even the passage we have read today? How might you reorient your posture toward God and the possibilities he has? How will we respond to him as king? Not our finances, not those people who say smart stuff on TV, not the 10 suggestions that we read as we were scrolling. How do we reorient so Jesus is king? My hunch is, if your life is like mine, all kinds of things try to take the lead in my life, including me. And all of them are lousy kings. So how will we make a habit of not just sitting and letting Jesus do what he's gonna do, but responding and acting in accordance with what he said? And then finally, how will we share what we are finding? There's people out there trusting all kinds of kings. Can I get an uh-huh? People out there with all kinds, either they wanna be in charge or they want you to follow the people they think is in charge. People out there, all, they're relying on all kinds of other providers, chasing bread that is gonna be here today and gone tomorrow, settling for bread that doesn't last. But we are just beginning to understand what it is to trust Jesus and find bread that lasts, bread that actually produces life in us. And so I just wanna say, for all of us who are sitting with Jesus and living in that direction, we can't fail to invite others in his direction, sharing what we're finding. We don't need to have everything. Did anyone have everything that was needed to, fi to feed 15 to 20,000 people? One kid with a sack lunch, that's us. I'm just gonna go with what I got and trust Jesus to do what he's gonna do. These followers of Jesus who he was inviting to be disciple makers, they're looking at 15,000 people saying, we don't know what to do. And Jesus says, sit down, I got this. Don't be overwhelmed. It's not too many, it's too many for you, but it's not too many for me, Jesus is saying. You look across the landscape of your life of people that are close to you but far from God, it may feel like way too many. Listen, just bring the lunch you got. Jesus already knows. Five bread, two fish, plenty for him. All he needs is someone who acknowledges him as king, offering him what he has, and you get to be bring your kid to work day with Jesus. I think the best thing we can do in this moment is decide what step are you gonna take? 
Or are you gonna decide to sit with Jesus each day? Do you need to take another step of obedience, moving out of scarcity and into the kind of abundance that Jesus has in mind for us? Or do you need to begin speaking more about the very things you have been finding with God in the people in your life, trusting that God will do what you can't do? Which one is you today? Pick one, one, two, or three. If you're willing to take action on the things that you've heard in one of those three things, just hold up that number of fingers to somebody around you that you trust. Just a little quick, like, I'm gonna do number one. I'm gonna do number two. I'm gonna do number three. And ask them to support you and ask, check in on you later this week. Because we don't wanna be people who hear from God. We wanna be people who do what he says. Remembering that he is king. As we finish our time, we're gonna do two last things. We're gonna sing a song here in just a moment that is all about Jesus as king. And for all of us who are followers of Jesus, I wanna encourage you to take this opportunity to just acknowledge and confess and say to God any other things that you have been trusting as king just this week. Don't think your whole life, just this week. What have, what have you tried to put up on the throne of your life that you've been putting trust in and it's creating worry and fear and scarcity and anything else? Just acknowledge it. Followers of Jesus, we know this. He already forgave us. He already knows. You're not surprising him. Are you kidding me right now? He already paid for it. He gave his life for it so that we would never be separate from him. So we have nothing to hide, nothing to prove, nothing to fear. We can just name it and ask for his help and just acknowledge Jesus, your king. This song is gonna help you do that. Just acknowledge any of those places and then allow your memory to fill with all the times Jesus has been a benevolent and good king in your life and just acknowledge him and praise him for the times he's shown up in great ways. And for any of you who would not say Jesus is king, you would not call yourself a follower of Jesus, I encourage you this week to seek out the stories of those people that you know. Or perhaps today, Jesus has been moving in you to say, actually, I have good in mind for you, and you're starting to trust it. I just encourage you to say yes to Jesus in any way that you can in this moment, and then tell someone you know as soon as possible. You could tell our prayer team down front. You could tell people at the info center, but do not leave this place. If you wanna point your life toward Jesus, tell someone yes today. So this week, let's lean in. Let's look for provision first from him, presence with him, putting into practice the things that Jesus invites us into and being bold to share with others. Not worried about how little we have, but how much he can do with what we have. If we can support you any way along the way, we'd love to. Head over to canyonridge.org where you'll find everything you need to know along with a way to get in touch with us. If this was helpful, I encourage you to share it with a friend and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you soon.